Monsieur de Germain uttered the words, when one goes by the name of Marquis de saint Lou, with some emphasis, and yet he knew very well that it was a far greater thing to go by the name of Duc de Germain. But if his self-esteem had a tendency to exaggerate, if anything, the superiority of the title Duc de Germain over all others, it was perhaps not so much the rules of good taste as the laws of imagination that prompted him thus to diminish it. Each of us sees in brighter colors what he sees at a distance, what he sees in other people. For the general laws which govern perspective in imagination apply just as much to dukes as to ordinary mortals. And not only the laws of imagination, but those of speech. Now, one or other of two laws of speech might apply here. One of them demands that we should express ourselves like others of our mental category and not of our caste. Under this law, Monsieur de Germont might, in his choice of expressions, even when he wished to talk about the nobility, be indebted to the humblest little tradesman, who would have said, when one goes by the name of Duc de Germont, whereas an educated man, a swan, a Le Grandin, would not have said it. A duke may write novels worthy of a grocer, even about life in high society, titles and pedigrees being of no help to him there, and the writings of a plebeian may deserve the epithet aristocratic, who in this instance had been the inferior f from whom Monsieur de Germain had picked up when one goes by the name. He had probably not the least idea. But another law of speech is that, from time to time, as diseases appear and the vanish, of which nothing more is ever heard, there come into being, no one knows how, spontaneously perhaps, or by an accident, like that which introduced into France a certain weed from America, the seeds of which, caught in the wool of a traveling rug, fell on a railway embankment, modes of expression which one hears in the same decade on the lips of people who have not in any way combined together to that end. So, just as in a certain year I heard Bloch say, referring to himself, that the most charming people, the most brilliant, the best known, the most exclusive, have discovered that there is only one man in Paris whom they felt to be intelligent and agreeable, whom they could not do without, namely, Bloch and heard the same remark used by countless other young men, who did not know him, and varied it only by substituting their own names for his. So, I was often to hear this when one goes by the name. Hey, this is Nathan. This is David. And this is Nick. And welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. Where today we are continuing on our journey through Marcel Proust's In Search of Lost Time, this time on to Volume 3, The German Way. And a few disclaimers if you are picking up in the middle of this series. Two things we normally say at the beginning. Number one, we're reading the Moncrief and Kilmartin translation. Number two, our French pronunciations are typically poor. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. And we'll change mid-podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Variability is exciting. So, as our normal format, recapping this one, which, by the way, uh, just a, a quick poll from you guys, was super exciting, right? Heavy oh, really? into German. Whew, he riveting. said ironically. You know what I really loved was hearing about the differences between the Germans and the Covassiers or whatever the fuck oh, the name was near yeah. the end. Oh, oh just riveting. Just riveting stuff. Around, <laughs> around the loop. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so... Let's let's just kick this off. The, yeah, oh yeah, I, I got it kicked off. Can't do the. Yeah. Oh. Cheers. It's not, a, it's not a bottle of wine, but we'll we'll take it. So, uh, what what happened in this? Let's start from the top. Narrator and family move to a new spot. It's basically like in the Hotel de Germain. So he's kind of like sidling up to I don't know, being cozier with the family, and he kind of gets like obsessed with it. There's a kind of an early scene where they go see an opera and there's sort of the whole like German crew and he's he's observing it's not a it's not a, not a Brigat. Brigat is the writer. Who's the it, Burma. Burma. Madame Burma. Yeah. And there's actually a nice little piece in there about That was really you know, nice the, actually. Yeah, the performer versus the work of art and as the work of art sort of gains, I don't know, some level or hits some sort of forward momentum, the performer kind of recedes from view. I thought that was that was nice. He goes into how his perception and expectation ruined his initial viewing of the uh, the opera. I think it's Phaedra, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And 
I don't know if you mentioned, but they the move was from Combre to Paris, right? Correct. He's yes, in the so city now. Back in, okay. in the city. Um, and then we get into kind of the uh, the nice first stalking section of <laughs> being so obsessed with uh, Madame de German that he's just trying to run into her at all points of the day and all strategically timed walks. Did you get like Rushmore vibes? Like, uh, yeah, yes. that's exactly Rushmore. what I thought about, actually. <laughs> that is, yeah. I couldn't place it the whole time, but if, yeah, like a guy that's just like out of place. Yeah. But he's he's pretty smart, but like awkward and sort of shouldn't be there and everyone's tolerating him, but you don't understand why they don't just like push him out, but he's still there the whole time. Yeah. And isn't the Duchess like a lot older than him? Well, yeah. Welcome to Perpetual Question. How old is he in this book? Right? Twenty five. No well, his father has that little speech where he's like, Oh, soon you're gonna be a man and you gotta join society. It's like, wait, I thought he already did that. You know, with the so okay, so the prostitutes this is a very relevant and the other yeah, well, that's, situations, but <laughs> as we said, maybe that happens at fourteen. But that's a good segue into the very next sort of section where he basically he's trying to strategize how he's going to run into the Duchess, and so he goes and leaves to visit Saint Lou, and then is like scared of sleeping by himself. He doesn't like new rooms again. And so he like needs to sleep in his room again. Like I just keep thinking, like how old is this person? <laughs> are they eleven? And he's visiting his buddy in the military. And I don't know how the military functions, especially at turn of the century France. But it sounded like they just kind of stopped what they were doing so this one guy Saint Lou could hang out with his buddy. Like oh, don't worry. Yeah, yeah the the guy in charge of this troop, he's cool with it. I said, hey, I'm visiting my friend. He's like, oh, you're visiting your friend? Well, let's just stop and hang out then for a while. Yeah. <laughs> right? Is that, is that anyone else's perception? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I assume I mean, because he's a marquee. Like really accommodating of him. Maybe. I think, yeah, he's like, a, he's like an aristocrat soldier. So they just yeah, kind of do I, whatever he wants, it seems. Well, do you remember in War and Peace when, uh, what's his name? Ah, uh, yes. Never forget old what's his name. <laughs> P- Pierre. Gets his garrison together or whatever. It's just like, what is the military? It's just rich people and their peasants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also a good segue. You guys are just teeing this up, right? Because then it gets into the whole sort of discussions of military science as art. But then it Mm -hmm. tees up the first of many mentions of the Dreyfus Affair, Mm -hmm. which is at its core outside of the uh, racism, anti-Semitism. It is actually a fundamental battle of the new military versus the old military sort of the elitists up through the kind of pre-republic france versus kind of the new meritocratic meritocratic i'm just gonna sound that word meritocratic i can never say it meritocracy based (laughs) uh military side Whew, we're just gonna cut out. can't can't pronounce french words can't pronounce english words maybe we can come back to the the dreyfus affair I mean, I'm sure we'll yeah. come back to it a little bit, but that's a whole that's a whole section. That'll be a whole section of this podcast. But I, I, yeah, I just wanted to note that he doesn't really define what it is. It comes up a lot, but in the book, I don't think he ever really tells you what it is, and that's kind of. Yeah. I was like, is that is he teasing us with that, or was it just such a big issue that you wouldn't have to define it? I think, especially amongst the, the French audience, there's no there would be no need to define it. Mm. Yeah, and doing so would only possibly hurt the audience because I think if he were to define it in one way or the other, it might actually say, "Oh, he's picked a side." He's, I'm assuming. I'm not sure how far into the future from publication this was yeah, from the should, actual affair. Let's uh, let's just like bound that conversation thing, and we'll, we'll get to that okay. whole chunk. Because I got really into the Dreyfus affair. Right. I started reading a whole, like a book. I'm like halfway through it. And it Ooh. basically like explains like all politics everywhere ever. Oh, and the way like Proust sort of treated it, I thought I thought was great for exactly that reason. That he didn't really define it, and it's basically just offering the glimpses of people's reactions to it, yeah. mm. which is very much like how it all kind of manifested itself in France. But we'll table that back to trying to figure out some semblance of a plot here. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so. We get into, uh, he's he's visiting St. Loup. They talk about military strategy, get into Dreyfus Affair. Uh, ultimately, he ends up back in Paris. He's called from uh, grandmother. Oh, you forgot phone, to mention right? St. Loup's mistress. Yes. Well, 
That's, they haven't met I think yet, we're, though. I think we're getting right to that point. Yeah. Sorry. I thought that was before he back went back to, to visit the grandmother. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think, I think, yeah, I think he goes back. And then when St. Luke goes back as well, because he wants to go meet his mistress. So they're back in Paris. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And that's when, I mean, this is kind of one of the more exciting parts of, of the book. When, you know, he goes to meet his friend's mistress and he's like, yo, that's a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and it's, it's Rachel Wen from the Lord from, uh, I don't know, volume or two ago. Yeah. Um, Who's actually like just, really cool and smart. But she's also like the avant-garde uh, theater actress yeah remember there's that whole scene where where she was reciting her thing in one of the salons and it was just like terrible and grotesque and everybody was just like making fun of her yeah she's sort of part of that like i think new wave art crew Mm. of the paris scene yeah but yeah it gets into their whole relationship which is impressively toxic and not fun for everyone involved (laughs) unless you're i guess witnessing it yeah if we go back to the telephone scene that was one of my favorite scenes where he like that's true picks up the telephone oh and he's talking to somebody else's grandmother well there was that uh which that was great because it was like i guess the way it worked is you would just say you'd pick up the telephone and say like hi can i speak with so-and-so and And they would say so-and-so are you here and it just so happened that the names were the same but they were the wrong people yeah but there was this passage where he describes what it was like to talk to somebody on the telephone it, it, he describes it as like this like novel technology. I thought this was pretty great. You got a page number? If you don't mind me reading it to you. Uh, 173. Mm. Like all of us nowadays, I found too slow for my liking in its abrupt changes, the admirable sorcery, whereby a few moments are enough to bring before us, invisible but present, the person to whom we wish to speak, and who, while still sitting at his table in the town in which he lives, in my grandmother's case, Paris, under another sky than ours, and whether that is not necessarily the same, in the midst of circumstances and preoccupations of which we know nothing, and of which he is about to inform us, finds himself suddenly transported hundreds of miles, he and all the surroundings in which he remains immured, within reach of our ear, at the precise moment which our fancy has ordained. And we are like the person in the fairy tale, for whom a sorceress, at his express wish, conjures up in a supernatural light, his grandmother or his betrothed in the act of turning over a book, of shedding a tear, of gathering flowers close by the spectator and yet very far away, in the place where she actually is at the moment. We need only, so that the miracle may be accomplished, apply our lips to the magic orifice and invoke, occasionally for rather longer than seems to us necessary, I admit, the vigilant virgins to whose voices we listen every day without ever coming to know their faces and who are our guardian angels in the dizzy realm of darkness, whose portals they so jealously guard, the all-powerful by whose intervention the absent rise up at our side, without our being permitted to set eyes on them, the denieds of the unseen who incessantly empty and fill and transmit to one another the urns of sound, the ironic furies who, just as we were murmuring a confidence to a loved one, in the hope that no one could hear us, cry brutally, I'm listening, the ever-irritable handmaidens of the mystery, the umbrageous priestesses of the invisible, the young ladies of the telephone. (laughs) I like how he uh, he gets into this a lot with like kind of sensory elements of like music. And there's a section in here where he talks about um, like hearing response and like jamming stuff in your ear to basically block out different levels of sound and what that does to perception. But also when that starts to overlap, like when he kind of talks a little bit about evolving technology, Mm -hmm. like that's awesome too, which is not what I would have expected out of Proust. Because when I'm reading this in my head, I literally have no idea what year it is. So it's so foreign in all of the ways. And then talking about something like the telephone, you're like, oh yeah, it's still still kind of modern. I mean, it's a while ago, but there were these elements that were being introduced into society. I think it's like early 20th century, maybe? Yeah, I think it's... Because like it sounds like it's building up towards World War One. At least that was yeah. the hint. Well, so, Dreyfus Affair is 1890s. Okay. So that, that kind of grounds it. Because Charles but, oh. Drew mentions the Kaiser in Germany and... Bismarck. Yeah, the build up towards WW1. But yes, after that wonderful phone call scene 
there is the introduction of Rachel Wen from the Lord. And I want to read a part of this. The whole paragraph is amazing, but I will, I will take up my opportunity to throw in some quotes. But talking about the different perceptions of someone based on if it's him versus St. Lou. And so he says, I realized then how much a human imagination can put behind a little scrap of a face, such as this woman's was, if it is the imagination that has come to know it first, and conversely into what wretched elements, crudely material and utterly valueless, something that has been the inspiration of countless dreams might be decomposed if, on the contrary, it had been perceived in the opposite manner by the most casual and trivial acquaintance. I saw that what had appeared to me to be not worth 20 francs when it had been offered to me for 20 francs in the brothel, where it was then for me simply a woman desirous of earning 20 francs, might be worth more than a million, more than family affection, more than all the most coveted positions in life if one had begun by imagining her as a mysterious being, interesting to know, difficult to seize and to hold. No doubt it was the same thin and narrow face that we saw, Robert and I, but we had arrived at it by two opposite ways, which would never converge, and we would never both see it from the same side. And it continues on in a similar vein, but I thought that was very astute around a bit of a almost comedy of errors type of situation. And that's, that's a good lesson to keep in mind if you're ever marketing your services, sexual right. or otherwise. Yeah. Set your prices accordingly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they will come. But yeah, our perceptions of things, like how we fill in backstories is wild. I mean, so much of this book is about, you know, trying to get to very specific details, but it it can't ever approach a full understanding of anything. Mm. And I think that's one of the points, which is that even if you're not even close, your brain will fill in the rest of it. And if you try to fill it all in manually, you still won't even get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this whole volume is so much about expectation and perception being altered by time and maybe reality, but mostly it's just time because time is going to change everything. Either it's going to reveal something that is false or something that was once false and is now true. Like we talked about when he goes to see Burma perform, he realizes that is all the expectations he had were ruined his perception and i guess the same thing is kind of true for when he eventually gets into the salon of madame de germont mm -hmm. and how shallow and pointless it all is and how his love falls away mm -hmm. uh, something i thought uh, th he, he catches me by surprise sometimes because he kind of sometimes the narrator seems to know everything but then sometimes the narrator seems to present that he knows things that you realize he doesn't actually know. And I thought that when he's describing Rachel one from the Lord and how much he just despises her. And he's like, yes, we had a lot of the same tastes and we talked for hours about art and she had all these astute observations. She was still ultimately worthless. And like he keeps repeating, he, he would say like a compliment and then repeat that it didn't mean anything. And then would do the opposite with the Duchess Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a moment where they're kind of there. Those two interactions are almost overlapping his interaction with Rachel and his interaction, interaction with the Duchess. And the narrative keeps presenting the Duchess is like intelligent and noble, but everything that she says is fatuous, but he doesn't, you know, our narrator doesn't kind of admit that to us. Mm. Are you, are you hinting on the fact that because the Duchess is further away from him, he can, he can sort of hold her up to you know whatever pedestal but somebody that's very close to him in art artistic tastes and behaviors he is more critical of is that where you're getting at i think so i'm actually by the end of the book i'm not really sure i guess i'm jumping ahead a little bit but i'm not sure how he feels about the duchess at the end of the book because i thought he i thought it was gonna be like this arc where he's like oh these people are dumb and cruel and empty but he kind of at least he didn't really seem to get there to me he at the end of the book, he still he, he still seems to hold on to his idea that like oh, aristocracy is somehow important. And I'm I will understand how some way. And Rachel is still, I mean, she just kind of fades away. She doesn't really reappear mm -hmm. after this section. But but I, I think you're hinting on a character trait slash human behavior 
that I recently came across a term for that I think explains a lot of interactions, which is Freud's uh, title of calling this the narcissism of marginal difference. Basically saying that the closer you are, the more critical you are to somebody who is adjacent to you yeah. mm. versus people that are farther away. You You are more open to and you can kind of, there's enough distance to where you can sort of revere them. But if somebody's really close to you, it's like you can be harsh. Mm. It explains a lot of our political interactions. It explains mm. why, like, if, if you're in the death metal and your buddy's into grindcore, you sort of, like, hate each other somehow because, like, you're into, like, slightly different metal. Like, just because we draw lines in certainly arbitrary ways and the mo more narrow it gets, like, the more obsessed over the tiniest details we can be. I think there's also... In addition to that, he his, his what you read his immediate or his initial interaction with Rachel was she's a twenty dollar prostitute, and then he can't rewrite that mm -hmm. that initial observation. In the same way, he his initial observation of the Duchess. I was going to say not he he emphasizes the fact that she's an unwanted prostitute. At that, she mm. was the one that people didn't really want to in, to pay for, and she would. She was like, call up the madame of the brothel, be like, please let me know if anyone wants me or needs me, kind of thing. And I think from mm. the previous book, it's mentioned, oh, I could have her any time because nobody else wanted her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that. There's the sense of falling into what other people desire and want, mm. which is a huge thing and works to his advantage later in the book, right? Right. When he eventually gets called up to the sort of big league, so to speak, because he's somehow, which I never fully understand, deemed to be interesting. It, it kind of becomes, have you seen Being There with Peter Sellers? Oh, yeah. One of the greatest, my favorite Hal Ashby a, movie. Yeah. <laughs> becomes a little Being There. Where he's just like, I don't he's know how I got Chauncey here, Gardner. Gonna, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, does this mean we're heading into the salon section? I think we have to. Are it's we there the majority yet? majority of the book. <laughs> well so let's yeah let's let's wait and do it here we go so at this point in the book he ends up at madame de villa Paracy, her salon and this is where we get uh the scene also overlapping with dreyfus affair topics but with bloke sort of interrogating everyone trying to like pin down what their opinions are mm -hmm. and they're all very what do i say they're they're trying to escape being pinned down while being polite and playing those games but they're very clearly sort of anti-semitic like yeah stop yeah exactly Get out of here. Stop doing this. Like, don't make us say it. So yeah, again, more more material for the, the Dreyfus Affair topic. Um, but then we get sort of that introduction to uh, Charlou, who we, we learn is the brother of the Duke. And this, <laughs> I want to talk about this guy. Yeah. Uh, because this first introduction to him, uh, the narrator is like advised not to go home with him. And He's basically waiting for cabs and he's specifically like passing over certain cabs in order to get one that's driven by somebody who's basically hammered. And then he finds one and then drives the cab and then I think throws the drunk cab driver in the back. And it's sort of implied that he's going to take advantage of him. Is that the correct interpretation? I, I remember that like he chose the cab driver yeah. who was hammered, but yeah. I don't really remember what happened after that. And this was as this was after he was walking. Sorry, our narrator was walking with Charles, and he was saying, "Oh, I'll, I'll take you under my wing. I'll." Yeah. And he's like, yeah. "I'll teach you everything I know." And then they caught eyes with another guy in the street, and or the perception seemed to switch. Like, "Oh, this guy was friendly to me an hour ago, but now that I'm walking down the street, he seems cold." Almost as if people kind of know that this is some sort of old lech who's picking up a young man, maybe. Or trying I think to. So I mean that that's the vibe I got. Right. I'm trying to find the exact like phrasings where yeah, it's weird. He just like he keeps pa like passing over all these very obvious selections, and then the the cab is described as like zigzagging like all the way across the street, and then he kind of like gets on. He's like, I think I should drive. Why don't you just like go sleep in the back? And the cab driver who's just you know hammered is like, yeah, that sounds great. And I, I guess I didn't necessarily think it at the time when reading that just seemed like a odd behavior. But later, when we get to the narrator's additional interaction with him... That scene was insane. That's kind of what framed <laughs> it. That scene was wild. Yeah. 
But again, once again, common theme, getting ahead of ourselves, table that. Now, okay. now did <laughs> was this the first his first interaction with Charlu? No, or Charlu was in the, um the in the previous book. book. He showed up before. But And he he like went to his room. I didn't really understand what's happening. Was that was that Charlu? Yeah, I believe so. He was like so. really friendly with him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was a prior interaction, but I, I think it, it wasn't enough to like create a specific persona or something in my head. It wasn't until this volume that that we got more exposure into his behavior, mm. we shall say. Yeah. But moving from there, we then get to the scenes where he's in narrators in Champ Elysee with his grandmother. And basically, her her grandma, his grandmother, has the stroke, mm-hmm. and that section of writing was excellent. Yeah, that was beautiful. Yeah. You know, the description of just like depressing a human body and being sort of like kind of contained and oh man, there's a great stuff. quote about that i can't remember what it is there's a few from that section but there's there's one about how we sort of forget that we're trapped inside of the human body Mm -hmm. yeah that's the one it is in sickness that we are compelled to recognize that we do not live alone but are chained to a being from a different realm from whom we are worlds apart who has no knowledge of us and by whom it is impossible to make ourselves understood our body i want to follow on on to that with uh with this that reads Yes, it might have been said that a few minutes earlier while I was looking for a cab, my grandmother was resting on a bench in the Avenue Gabriel, and that a little later she had driven past in an open carriage. But would it really have been true? A bench, in order to maintain its position at the side of an avenue, although it may also be subject to certain conditions of equilibrium, has no need of energy. But in order for a living being to be stable, even when supported by a bench or in a carriage, there must be a tension of forces which we do not ordinarily perceive any more than we perceive because its action is multidimensional, atmospheric pressure. Perhaps if a vacuum were created within us and we were left to bear the pressure of the air, we should feel in the moment that preceded our extinction the terrible weight which there was now nothing else to neutralize. And again... Proust science writing. That's my pitch for this book. It gets into writing about phones and auditory stuff and talks about x rays a lot. Pressure and yeah, x rays, medical technology. This is like, I don't think people are thinking as Proust as sort of like a technological evangelist, but it's in there. Yeah, definitely. And the description of her slow deterioration in bed was so depressing. Mm. but yeah. in just incredibly well-written and moving, I thought. And I, I thought that also this is a moment that it's his the writing kind of style changes. It becomes so yeah. kind of focused on this one person and his emotions about it. And then on the book ending, that is absolute nonsense. And he see our narrator seems un- incapable of distinguishing the sort of vital human experience of the death of his grandmother and the nonsense of society life. Mm-hmm. Are you saying you're saying Proust has done this purposefully as a way to draw attention to the narrator's? I mean, it's kind of my feeling. I mean, yeah. I, I kind of feel like he does. He's, he's done that in a different way in each of these three novels. Um, mm. In the past two, I think he kind of like saved that to the end. And this one, he sticks it right in the middle. Mm all of these games that we play in life that we think are like the real deal. And then something comes like crashing in on that and reminds you, I mean, I wouldn't say that he's necessarily saying that it's the important stuff, but I feel this emotional kind of greater emotional weight of it when it's juxtaposed with the, the monotony, the banality of, Whatever it is, you know, in this case, society, in the previous case, like him trying to get into this society of girls. I think Proust, the author, is revealing this to us in his sort of the way that he's approaching it formally in his writing. But his protagonist isn't telling it to us. The protagonist doesn't seem to be realizing it himself. And so I think there's there's a sort of beauty and a sadness to that. That's like he he doesn't have that epiphany that's like, oh, it's important for me to be close to and take care of the people that are actually important to me, not the Duchess, who's an idiot. He doesn't have that that epiphany. So this sets up a topic that I've been thinking a, a lot about 
which is I'm starting to feel that I don't really think of this as a novel. And what I mean by that is a novel or fiction is basically an author taking blank experiences, ideas, something, and packaging them in a way that is consumable in a certain way. You know, emphasizing the things that need to be emphasized, perhaps not emphasizing the things that don't. Obviously, a lot of artistic and aesthetic leeway with that. But to your point, Nathan, there is no, there is no specific you know, weighting in the text of these elements. They are just jammed together. And you could also argue just from sheer word count, that far more of the waiting goes to the salons and the the great deal more banal bullshit, right? And so, in a way, it it this hasn't been filtered through a traditional fiction writer's voice. No. And so, what it feels like is such a hyper zoom in that if you think of you know to tie into some science writing, I know Nathan, you're getting into synthesizers and stuff now. If you think of like a sine wave, right? So like a tone, and you think of what that looks like. Essentially, that is a changing waveform. But if you look at a time scale that is narrow enough, that that sine wave will look flat. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Because there's always a minute level of resolution in which something is not moving. Right? And I feel like that's what he's doing with the book, which is actually the exact opposite of what fiction is in my head, Mm. which is somebody interpreting, you know, X in a way that is more poignant or impactful in a novel form. And so this, the grandmother dying section, my favorite part of the book by far, emotionally moving, excellent writing, super beautiful. It's the best, but it should have been two thirds of the book. The rest of this shit should have been one third. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know if there's a point there. I don't know if it's something practical, like there just was no editor who was going to go against that. I don't know if this is a big statement. Like I, like I just revealing don't know who the point. character really is by showing you he is actually shallow, and yeah, that the death of his grandmother, while affecting in the moment, almost vanishes from his thoughts completely. And we immediately mm-hmm. go back into him just observing the salon and recording it for the reader. Because his involvement with mm-hmm. it is little to none other than his presence. It's mostly yeah, it's us. Like two sentences. Yeah. It's us seeing how he observes and captures all of it. Not, not editing it himself, but just yeah. here's the conversations these people have about the different families and what they have and who's related to who and who did this at their party. And you're like, I don't, what? And yet it's so much of this, especially the latter half after the grandmother's death. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I found it very hard to finish this book. Totally. And I I feel like if, if somebody argued that this was a specific aesthetic thing to, you know, basically show the character's depth or lack thereof, Mm. I'd be like, I get it. But I also wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily disagree if somebody came out and said like, oh yeah, Bruce just, the author wrote a shitload and nobody, nobody pulled it in. <laughs> like nobody trimmed it. I don't know. They're both, they're both reasonable angles of the text yeah. at this point with my lack of specific research. It, it feels to me like it's, I guess, to give Proust the benefit of the doubt, it's like trying to be a reflection of what it's like to live, not... You know, I, I think sometimes like I like to look to fiction to as a way to give like a pattern to my life. Like how how do you make meaning in your life? Fiction writers mm-hmm. do that. They they take events, they pattern them in such a way that they fit into your brain in a way that feels meaningful. Mm. And Proust is kind of not doing that. He's saying, This is what it's like to live. <laughs> you keep going out in society. You don't actually change like that. Maybe yeah. this character will change, but it's gonna take volumes of writing to see this character change he's not going to have a couple a salons yeah he's gonna he's gonna keep <laughs> going to the salons he's gonna keep following down this dead end path much longer than you think that a character in a movie or in a tv show should they should yeah. like come on let's learn the lesson because you know that's what you do yeah exactly you meaning everybody yeah exactly and the royal you which is maybe why it took him I mean, how many pages is this this is like a million words in this novel, so maybe that's what he was doing. Doesn't so make it any I want to take easier. This, 
to read. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't help me now. <laughs> yeah. Although, again, th- that doesn't mean there aren't moments of beauty and insight. There's one thing that, uh, and here this is kind of hinted at his perception of, of the lesson, if there is a lesson that he sort of learns. But it, it's brief, and it kind of returns back to the salon. But he says, when all was said, the stories I heard at Madame, or Madame de Guermont's very different in this respect from what I had felt in the case of the Hawthorns, or when I tasted the Medellin, remained alien to me. Entering me for a moment and possessing me only physically, it was as though being of a social, not an individual nature, they were impatient to escape. Meaning that all of the things that he's taken in wanted to leave him immediately because they had almost no value. Unlike the Hawthorns, unlike the... Is it Medellin? No, that's the city in Colombia. In, in Colombia. <laughs> Me- uh, Medellin. Madeline. Medellin. Medellin. <laughs> Madeline. Medellin. Medellin. Sorry. Oh, yeah. The one, the one Proust scene you're supposed to remember. I know. Is the Madeline. <laughs> they bludgeons you with so many memories; it's hard to parse them. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this summary through to the end. Oh, okay. I thought uh, we've done that. Okay. No, what's so? It's actually fascinating. Is that technically we're actually we're only at the midpoint of the book. In terms of events, oh, basically, the, you know, the grandmother dies halfway. Um, so we got a whole other section. But luckily for the listener, you can read all the details of the salon because I'm not going to get into all those because <laughs> there's a lot. Um, but essentially, we have we have St. Luke who's basically trying to hook up the narrator with this new lady, kind of newly divorced, the Madame de Ster Maria. Um, ultimately gets shut down by the woman at, at last moment's notice. But then Albertine shows back up and he realizes that he no longer wants her. But then because doesn't he stop no him from fooling wants, around. Right. <laughs> because he is not interested, the dynamics have changed and she's interested. And he's like, yeah, I guess I'll do it. <laughs> Which in the book, it sounds like they just kiss, but I don't think that's true. Uh... It seems... Because they're like all like far in more than that. And flustered, yeah. and and they're kind of like they're caught, and they're you know trying to hide it. So there's seems, definitely some petting. Seemed PG thirteen at minimum. But then we get into the true salon stuff, where basically he's at Madame de Villa Paris, and Madame de Germa uh, it invites him somehow for no reason to to dinner. Yeah, and uh, that's when the whole section of the deep dive into the German party, you know, essentially the, the wit, the behaviors, the comparisons to the, the Cavassiers, the really specific jokes. And some of this was quite funny. Mm-hmm. The whole, like the whole thing of the, the Augustus teaser joke <laughs> that was just like repeated over and over and like then explained like, no, you don't understand. It's Augustus teaser. It just reminds me like, if you've ever had the viewpoint of of being with someone watching them tell the same story or joke in different social settings and still trying to like stick the landing every time, we all do it, right? We only have a certain number of things that we share, but it's so painful. It's such a terrible like third person view to like catch somebody doing that. And that was their whole lives, right? I mean, her the the duchess was basically just trying to stick witticisms for I don't know, professionally, I suppose. Mhm. That's that's all they had. Uh, so yeah, we get we get the over and over looping around of what the the Germans wit is, uh, and then here's the scene I want to talk about is the whole Charlu thing, where the narrator goes to see him and Charlu is just like super mean to him, just <laughs> yeah. telling the narrator how terrible he is and pushes him to the edge to where the narrator just destroys his hat. Yeah. And rips it to shreds. All the way to the edge. And then, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the worst possible thing that could happen is ripping up your hat. Well, he, he uh, did then, consider beating the man. But he's like, no, no, you're too old. I can't, I'm just going to rip up this hat. But they, then the guy was kind of like, it's fine. And he was like, nice to him again. That kind was like, of. He chased him down. He's yeah. like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then he brought him back to the room and then continued and then berated him again. to berate him, actually. That's true. <laughs> it was a multi-wave. Yeah. <laughs> but I, could somebody help me interpret what that was? I don't, I don't understand it. It came out of nowhere. The language of it, of him saying how much I can no longer love you, I revealed my affections, and how there's this secret code that only certain 
people can understand, and yet you fail to to reciprocate or return the answer. Mm-hmm. There's all of these small hints that it really feels like it was entirely set up so that he could become this man's lover. Yeah, it definitely feels like a sexual subtext. And that's what kind of made me, to go back to a prior point, think of the cab drunkenness episode as like, is that what was implied here? So it's very heavy on on the emotions and and that sort of element. Yeah. yeah very weird. I, yeah. I know that you say that it kind of makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, because otherwise thought, it doesn't really make much sense at all. It's, hey, I was going to teach you something, but you ignored it. So now I'm going to spurn you. The way I, the way I read it was he was he's a rich, out of touch, eccentric egomaniac and doesn't understand how to communicate with people, takes everything personally. Like there was he, I mean uh, that's certainly the narr- there. The narrator describes one like when he enters his room and then Charlu like doesn't acknowledge, acknowledge that he's there. <laughs> yeah. He just sits in his throne like a silently <laughs> And he likes to play this game with his guests where he pretends that he's a king and they can't sit down until he acknowledges them. Mm-hmm. And he tries to make yeah. them wait as long as possible. You know you know what this really felt like? The Kafka story we did a little a couple episodes back, The Judgment. Oh, yeah. That flip out moment where the dad just just goes off on his son. Like it went from just sort of everything was calm and then there was just this explosion of weird nonsensical behavior yes that was like really penetrating and mean and and yeah they're, they're yeah you're they're a dilettante you don't even know block. what you're sitting on you don't know what good <laughs> art is <laughs> yeah <laughs> you parasite it's, he's yeah he's so abusive and manipulative he's like i'm sorry if i hurt you how dare you think that you have the ability yeah. to hurt oh, me? oh that was a great <laughs> a great line yeah yeah so in summary passions inflamed and <laughs> This brings us to home stretch moment, which is the the final, at least of the volume, German invitation that the narrator receives. And I think the way it, it shakes out is he receives the invitation and it feels feels sort of weird because I think it's for an event that's further out. And so he, he goes to see them to sort of clarify or see if it's real. And that's when Swan re-enters the picture. Hmm. And that's when the, the, the Duke and the Duchess are are sort of pushing him, saying, hey, we're doing this thing. It's in 10 months. Why aren't you coming? You know, you say you can't, but whatever you the conflict you have, you can resolve it. And I guess this is where spoiler alert comes. If you happen to be 45 minutes into this episode and <laughs> are worried about spoilers, uh, basically Swan is just like, I'm not coming because I'm going to be dead by then. Like, oh, you can't make it to Italy? Why not? Live. Well, I'll be dead. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be dead. And honestly, pretty good ending. Pretty good ending. It was. Proust can stick the ending. Yeah. Similar to that, with that, he's like, I'm a, I'm going to be dead. I'm not going to make it to Italy. And then the Duchess is like stuck in this conflict. She's like, I can't be late to dinner, but my friend oh, yeah. is dying. What do I do? So, so she just goes, um, eh, I don't gonna believe you. I'm just going to pretend that's not true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't believe you. Uh, I got to go. And then the Duke is like, you're wearing black shoes. That oh, is yeah. not going to fly. Right. Go put on red shoes, get, but we're going to be late. Red shoes. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Which reminded me of when the grandmother was dying and the Duke comes out and introduces himself. Well, oh, yeah. allows himself to be introduced to the family for the first time. And he's like, I'm going to bestow upon this grieving woman the honor of meeting me. And she's just his the narrator's mother. Is so like distraught because her mother is. In well, the last I, I think it's mentioned lives. as well that the grandmother didn't like the duke and found him to be a bore oh i don't remember that i I feel like it's mentioned that the grandmother had met him long ago and had a low opinion of him that's my remembering perception anyway which made that that scene even funnier even better yeah (laughs) and and the mother like he's like allow me to introduce myself i and she's like i don't have time for this we need to go do this blah 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 and he's standing there, like, still trying to go through the motions of introducing himself. <laughs> and he's like, and then forever after, he was like, she was pretty rude. <laughs> Don't these lives just seem terrible? Oh. <laughs> like. The worst. Like, all day. Just this? I don't know. That's why I'm not an aristocrat. It's the main reason. Main reason. Just can't stand the company. 
Can we talk about the Dreyfus affair now? Yes, we can. Okay, so I got I got into the Dreyfus affair. I read uh, I'm like halfway through uh, the Man on Devil's Island by Ruth Harris, and uh, basically kind of a pretty detailed account of this event that you know if you read a Wikipedia article or check out something has gotten very very simplified in sort of the historical rear view. And so that being that Dreyfus was essentially in the French army. And he was accused of espionage when it was very clearly another person. Dreyfus, who was a Jew, um, ran into plenty of racist and anti-Semitic uh, pressures. And then he was convicted and sort of, despite repeated appeals and um, societal uh, upheavals, basically it took a long time for him to get properly, uh, what's, the, what's the legal term for being overturned in terms of your guilty conviction? Acquitted. Acquitted, yes. So for him to be acquitted, uh, which never fully happened, it basically, he, after many years, was um, kind of released, but nobody ever apologized. The French government just kind of swept it under the rug um, because tensions had been so so uh, high throughout the whole process that it was their way of trying to resolve it without kind of admitting the error. So anyway, it, basically, it's this tale of uh, racism in turn of the century France, and um, that's how it's summarized. But the levels of the political details and the camps, I feel like, give a lot of insight into the specific discussions and Dreyfus affair-oriented moments of the Proust telling of it, which is basically, it wasn't anti-Semitics versus Jews, it was lots of kind of coalitions of different parties. And so there's important backgrounds to take into account, which is Dreyfus came from the Alsatian region of France, which basically kind of flip-flopped between German and uh, French, uh, I guess, occupation or ownership. And so there was a huge element of uh, Dreyfus was Jewish, but that was also kind of a German Protestant version. So it was a question of whether or not that actually belonged in France to start with. And so the fact that he came through that element, he sort of became a double outsider. And because of that double outsider path, he went through a section of military training. Uh, The institution was more kind of, I think of it as like the newer crop of recruits versus the older pre-republic aristocratic crop that came up through uh, the section of the French military that was based on standing and title and things like that. So essentially he got thrown under the bus by some parties because he was Jewish, but by others because he was kind of representative of the new French Republic and the the meritocracy associated with that, that anyone can come from anywhere and and excel. And so you had those elements that kind of created this simmering pot where you had, you know, crazy kind of anti-Semitic nationalists within uh, like Catholic France, but you also had people that were just trying to reinforce the existing or rather the the previous aristocratic order that no longer existed once they converted to a republic. And then the whole thing got stirred up when uh, Emile Zola wrote J'accuse, which was this big moment in France, which, you know, arguably one of the, the biggest authors around uh, the year 1900, um, basically decided to chime in on it even though he wasn't explicitly a political writer and kind of stirred up emotions so much that all of Paris was basically rioting and he had to flee Paris to flee France made it to England with they say like his toothbrush he had to go into exile because he just he kind of poured gasoline on the whole thing and there's lots of criticisms of Zola actually that he kind of took a sensationalist almost fictional view of it that was perhaps not as tied to reality as some of the people who wanted to just clear Dreyfus based on facts wanted to have it. So there's arguments that he sort of turned it into more of this fictional drama because that's what suited his writing style and his fiction. So all of this stuff as Bloke is going around trying to ask people for what their opinions are and they will and won't say. And there's a comment of like he's trying to pin down somebody who's not a native Frenchman And I remember the comment, uh, I forget the character in in the salon, but they just said something along the lines of like, oh, we don't have opinions 
outside of France on French affairs, which is his way of saying, like, don't ask me. Like, I know what my opinion is and it's not yours. So, like, don't make me say it. And so every single one of those, like, aristocrat people who were, you know, Dreyfusards or anti Dreyfusards are kind of battling that. Thus, when Swan, who is Jewish, ends up being firmly a Dreyfusard, it's kind of an interesting push because he is of money and of social standing, but also an outsider. So those like levels cycling to me are way more complicated than, you know, a brief summary of, you know, Jew framed for espionage. But in, at the end of, or, or in our historical understanding at this point, he was, whether because he was Jewish or an outsider or of the new guard, he he was unfairly, uh, now what's the opposite of acquitted? Convicted? Convicted. Con- convicted. He was unfairly convicted of a crime. Yeah, right? absolutely. We, yeah, there's no... Okay, that's not the issue. Basically people... Yeah, that's not the issue. I mean, there was no, there was no question of that. His... Like the handwriting samples, basically so many things were forged in the case against him. And like, there's no, there's no question of that. It was really, but the reinforcing elements of it were much more complicated in the Mm. kind of coalitions of power struggles within France. And honestly, it reminds me of, you know, a lot of stuff in the last five years of American politics that got so crazy where like there's a there's cartoons and things like from from French newspapers like showing how basically families can't talk about the Dreyfus affair because they just turn into brawls aka in America you can't talk about Trump at Thanksgiving because you and your uncle will come to blows or something like that so this is your way of saying Nick that Russia gate was a hoax and you support Trump 2024 <laughs> <laughs> can you run from jail he's not going to jail Sadly not. Um, but uh, yeah, it it just shows, I think, the opportunistic element of all of these things and the ability of history. I mean, this is kind of very much a Tolstoy thing, but history in quotes or capital, however you want to phrase it, is based on this concept of causality and sort of simplifying A goes to B and B goes to C and this is why it happened. And it's just a lot more detailed than that in who's trying to take advantage of this event and situation for their own gains, which is why you yeah. have basically like the aristocratic folk pairing with, you know, truly anti-Semitic nationalist kind of, uh, you know, worker level people who just really wanted to enforce a Catholic France. So they just cared about the concept of who's French and who's Catholic. And that's the real France. Yeah. Sorry, that was the quote near the end that talks about, um, says, noblemen are almost the only people from whom one learns as much as one does from peasants. Their conversation is adorned with everything that concerns the land, dwellings as people used to live in them long ago, old customs, everything of which the world of money is profoundly ignorant. Even supposing that the aristocratic, or sorry, the aristocrat most moderate in his aspirations has finally caught up with the period in which he lives. His mothers, his uncles, his great aunts keep in touch, which he recalls his childhood with the conditions of a life almost unknown today. In the death chamber of a contemporary corpse, Madame de Guermont would not have pointed out, but would immediately have noticed all the lapses from traditional customs. Sorry, it kind of goes on, but it's talking about how her and the people around her are obsessed with these sort of traditions and the same sort of like mentality Mm -hmm. that you would sometimes associate with peasants being obsessed with as well. Oh, that's Mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. Yeah. So my, my summary of it is not to say that this wasn't a, you know, anti Semitic racist, you know, type of event within France. I'm saying that within that, there are these additional layers that Proust, I think to go back to our early concept of saying, okay, we'll just have to table this is that because this was such an amazingly, hot topic in France. Everybody who is the French readership knows what it is. So A, there is no need to get into the details, which hurts us a little bit reading this, you know, um, so far in the future and not being of uh, kind of French history expert level people. Um, But he also is showing how contentious it was and the fine lines and divisions within people that even if they're all at this same dinner party, all at this same salon, they essentially 
can have very different opinions that are kind of hinging on whatever small element their of their lives they're looking to reinforce whatever opportunistic thing is driving them and so as much as some of those specific comments are kind of lost on me I probably have to go reread it on now understanding the context i see what he was trying to do and i would say within the salon scenes that much i at least appreciate and i think you can get that idea or at least i got it without really knowing what the dreyfus affair was at least not until it came up you know after the eighth or ninth time I decided to look it up, but in the beginning I didn't. But you could tell that it was something contentious that people were using to sort of gauge their, I guess, the audience or the people around them to, as a tool to sort of say this person is acceptable or not. I think it still mm-hmm. comes across in the writing whether you're aware of what it is. Yeah. Enter like flashpoint topic year 2022 in whatever you know house party you're going to. People will try to sort people based on just first level, two two simplified opinions of of complex issues, and you'll you'll see like friends or people you know that'll kind of lay into that, and it can be tricky to just be like, yeah, it, that that is what I think, but it's actually not as simple as that. And to see the fact that like human beings and society have been doing that for you know <laughs> forever, essentially, it's kind of reassuring. That's just like, oh, yeah, we're in a culture war for blank now. We will always be (laughs) in a culture war. (laughs) We've always been at war with the culture or East Asia. (laughs) Right. That's what Orville was talking about. I have have no segue out of that. (laughs) I don't think there is one. I did find the quote that I wanted to read of, what's his name, yelling. Do you suppose that it is within your power to offend me? You are evidently not aware to whom you are speaking. Do you imagine that the envenomed spittle of 500 little gentlemen of your type heaped heaped one upon another would succeed in slobbering so much as the tips of my August toes? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Oh, August toes. I know. I there are lines in this that I feel like if you tried to say in real life would be very fun. Yeah. I have a question for both of you, which is now that we're halfway through did this specific volume advance in search of lost time for you did this push push the narrative further did did you get more into it like how what purpose did did this specific book serve i think what frustrated me more than anything (laughs) it felt like a middle book to me felt like a middle book Yeah. Yeah. yeah i'm not really sure what this did i'm hoping that it becomes revealed that it was useful to read all of this later on mm-hmm. because it didn't seem to move much, advance much, develop much in this. It could have been summarized. His grandmother died. I don't know what yeah. else changed. If if someone's listening and, and hasn't read this volume, it's probably worth noting that in you know stepping through the summary, we've just taken some steps between events that are just like 300 pages further. <laughs> Because it's just hard to characterize any of those conversations and elements that happened. You know, there's just there's just pages upon pages that you have to push through in order to get to the next tangible or memorable thing. I've heard that the next book, Sodom and Gomorrah, is a lot of people's favorite. Of oh, really? All of them. Uh, yeah, it's Swan's Way, the first book, and Sodom and Gomorrah seems to be the two that people really like. So is this basically like you're saying that you're setting your anticipation and expectation high, and then you may be disappointed later, just like Proust was when he finally saw the the Burma performance? I got to be honest, it it will be hard to be disappointed further. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Everything after the grandmother's death, until Swan appeared and sort of redeemed the ending of the book, felt like a chore to me. Yeah, I, I have a confession to make. I was I was a little behind, and I was like, uh, to read this, I'm gonna have to. Oh, did you skip some? No, but I, no. I listened to an audiobook for the for the last like uh. 300 pages, and I was just like, I need to listen to it at every moment that I have available. I'm brushing my teeth. I'm listening to Proust. <laughs> I'm cooking dinner. I'm listening to Proust. <laughs> I'm walking around the block. I'm listening to Proust. I'm making love. Um, and, <laughs> and there was a section where I was listening. I was like, I need to read like 100 pages tonight. So I just like. Stopped working, sat down in bed, put on Proust, and uh, just like blazed through it. And I kept dozing off, 
But in like looking back through it, I have no idea which parts I dozed off through because I have equal memory and not memory of everything. That's what it feels like if you're reading. Yeah. <laughs> so that checks out. Yeah. I knew this is going to be the one that we, we kind of rag on a bit, but like there were moments in the salon passages that I was like, all right, I'm, I'm getting into the rhythm of this. I'm, I'm cool with it. I like the seventh time he's trying to explain, you know, the wit, <laughs> yeah, that whole section on the, the German wit. And at some point it started like fitting, but honestly for me, almost feels a little bit like sensory deprivation or like different kinds of writing deprivation where like, this is what you have. So eventually you, you get tuned to it and then start to find stuff that you like within it. And so I don't know if it was kind of like a hostage situation or not, but it wasn't entirely painful. That is my, that is my summary. I thought there were funny passages. I thought there were funny interactions and I actually thought the Duke was quite funny in like his cluelessness, but it was just so much of it. Somewhere between like page 500 and 700, it just felt like. Yeah. There was just mm-hmm. a lot, a lot of dialogue with people that you, you really have no attachment or connection to. A lot of just inane stories. It was like being at somebody's retirement party that you kind of know. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Right. Like you're not. You're not so detached that yeah. you can just like ignore everybody, but like you're halfway there. Yeah. One character we didn't really talk about. I'm curious if uh, what your take on this character is or who this character is, is Le Grandin. Oh, he was the funniest. The, mm-hmm. His what? his way of speaking really amused me. What's his deal? Is he aristocratic? He's, or is he... he's like very, very pompous and very i think he's like a sort of mirror version of the narrator he's wants to like sort of climb the the ladder because he he knew him as a child in that in town and he was the one that i think you read a quote by him about looking up at the sky and taking time to enjoy life and sort of i i'm pretty sure it's the same character but he's yeah he's he sort of ignores him at one of the parties he doesn't want to interact with him because he's like oh i can't I can't be seen to know this man <laughs> Because otherwise it'll lower my stature. Is he kind of the same age as the narrator? For I think he's older. He was a, lot a little older. older. I oh, think he he's is. older. Yeah. Okay. But there was one interaction he had with him early on about like him sending him his book and stuff that I thought yeah. was funny. I he's can't like, remember. You're not going to like it. It's you're not, not going to like yeah. it. Exactly. And he's like, if you if you enjoy the the company of these people, then you've lost all your dignity. I'm just going to go enjoy a pink moon rising over a violet sky. Yeah, but and then he it's sees him at the next party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, another thing that seems to be teed up is Bloch, like a th- the next big thing is is it his writing that's did you catch this? Yeah, he's like a playwright or something, right? Yeah. 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 But it seems like people can't quite believe he's the same person because they're like, oh, he's this really talented creative playwright but he's kind of a jackass a bore in person yeah antagonistic i mean he's 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 going up like he's going against the stream right i mean he's invited or or allowed to attend for the, like the playwright reasons but he is the biggest outsider of everybody but it's also subtly hinted at throughout this book that these salons are dying yeah that, which charlu sort of hints at in between his mad ravings about things that this is kind of, you know, all a charade. Yeah, I I think that's a good point. I remember reading that. And then if you view all the previous events, it seems very sad. Like everybody's trying to hold on to like a former glory. Mm. Yeah. But it's kind of has like good like Faulkner vibes in that respect. Just the the past is crumbling and, and you can't do anything about it. There's a line... We are attracted by any life which represents for us something unknown and strange, by a last illusion still unshattered. And if anything, this book feels like the shattering of the illusion without the epiphany. Mm. Like, Mm -hmm. like it's not fully realized there, but it certainly feels like that's what's happening. Like, this Mm -hmm. is the last shattering of the illusion of that he's going to be a part of this sort of society. And maybe we... I'm totally wrong about that. And the next book is going to be more salon nonsense. I mean, maybe it's also so hyper zoomed in in the details that the epiphany is just not happening in this volume. Yeah. 
I keep telling myself, remember, if you're pretending that this is like a 350 page book, you're only on page 175. 15. <laughs> <laughs> been reading this for a while but you're only half you're only on page 2100 (laughs) 3000 to go nonetheless i'm still looking forward to reading the next book i've got to figure out how to read this book at the right cadence because i'm like i'm doing good i'm reading going along and the next like all right you guys ready to record in two weeks (laughs) i'm like how did that time pass no i'm not ready to record (laughs) how dare nick have access to the calendar app on his phone yeah in order to plan his reading schedule i i'm not i i just figure that you know i don't need to plan my reading schedule i'll just read at a leisurely natural pace and i'll make it and i just don't i haven't done that on any of these so this one i feel like if i were to try to read this at a leisurely pace i don't i think i'd finish it yeah honestly it's like a concerted effort yeah it's funny that that's actually the uh, um, the reaction from uh, the book club. So the I think there's like a half dozen of us locally that are uh, pushing through it. And pretty much everyone has said that like if I don't schedule time in my day to get through blank number of pages, like I won't do it. And so people are like waking up early, like doing this before work, or like just like putting time on the calendar. Otherwise, uh, I feel like if you go away from this for a week or two, well, it's going to be real hard to get back in. But the flip side is once it's part of your routine, there is a comfort to it. Like even though that this is very, I think probably an obvious statement for everyone is that this is our least favorite so far. I'm still really looking forward to cracking open the next one. It's like, I don't know, there's an excitement to it because I feel like I've lived with the thing. So it's part of what I like. I even like like the type size of this and the book size. Like it's like it's like the right I don't know, I've just been conditioned to it maybe. But I also like It's a good ratio, tactile. it's a good uh yeah. level of emboldenedness or darkness of the text on the page. It's not too light. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like yeah. a I like a good paperback that's got a little bit of bend to it, but not too much. And then also one that feels weighty but isn't annoying to hold. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like you can do a little bit of one hand, but you know you're still still getting a little bit of a workout <laughs> <laughs> mentally, not physically, or both. Who's gonna end this episode? Not me. We could wrap this up the same way Proust wraps it up. I'm dying. The Duke <laughs> felt no compunction in speaking thus of his wife's ailments and his own to a dying man. For the former interested him more, and therefore appeared to him more important. And so, after gently showing us out, it was simply from breeding and jollity that in a stentorian voice, as if addressing someone off stage, he shouted from the gate to Swan, who was already in the courtyard, You, now, don't let yourself be alarmed by the nonsense of those damned doctors. They're fools. You're as sound as a bell. You'll bury us all. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. Yeah, and sad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> super sad. I like comedic bummers. It's a favorite genre of mine. What's... <laughs> Having a hard time reading this.